The X-Files ended in 2002, which was not long after the World Trade Center bombing. It seemed sort of superfluous because the American public had put their faith completely in the government. They didn't want to know about government conspiracies. They wanted to know that their government was protecting them. So it was really a time for us to leave the stage. But the wheels have been spinning for some time, and they are always spinning. I always see an X-Files story every time I open the paper. There's just always some interesting storyline. Well, it was really up to Fox at that point. You know, the second movie didn't perform well enough, I guess, for them to greenlight a third or even to, to consider developing a third. You know, I would occasionally put out feelers through my agents to Fox, but I never really got a sense that they were too hot for it. So I kind of given up on that idea. X-Files News was created in 2007. The site pretty much was informing the fans what the cast and crew was doing, also to campaign to get a third movie going because of the desire not only of the team behind it, but also because of the fans asking us don't give up. So it is a labor of love, really. On the show, it had been set up that, you know, the alien invasion was going to happen in December 2012. And everyone was like, well, if we're going to get a third movie, it needs to happen soon because is the world ending? What's going to happen then? For us, it was like that challenge. Can we make this third movie happen before that deadline? We'll come up with campaigns every other month on Twitter or sending postcards to the studio to let people know that the x files fandom was there and that they wanted this third movie to happen. Honestly, I was pretty sure that was the end of the X-Files. I did not think that there was going to be another movie or another TV show or anything like that. For some reason, it wasn't a show that people were really talking about a lot. But the Comic-Con panel that they had in 2013 sort of brought it back in the conversation. The 20th anniversary of the show, it kind of took me by surprise. I mean, that 20 years had elapsed. I actually worked on the show a year earlier than that, so it was 21 years for me. But the amazing thing about that reunion was seeing how well everyone had done their careers had taken off, but also seeing that uh, they'd had kids and those kids had grown up. So it provided for me a sense of continuity. It's our son. <laughs> Howard knows a little something about this because you guys are bringing back 24 for a limited series. Is that something, Chris, you would consider doing? And obviously, David and Jillian, is that something you'd be in? No. <laughs> no? How many no's did I say? <laughs> well, I guess I was pretty connected to the idea of us doing a film and you know, even in 2013, the idea of doing shorter stacks of episodes was brand new. Whenever I would talk about, oh, we could do eight, or we could do, you know, everybody was, you know, no, no, not on a major network. Major networks don't do short stacks. I think Jillian mentioned it at some point to me, like doing it on television. I don't think I ever put it together until it was put together for me. I just didn't, I just didn't think of it that way. I just always thought of, oh, X-Files, we're gonna have to do 25. Never, never again. The X-Files 20th anniversary started to swell of interest. I guess it was fun to be able to play a, a little bit of a part in that. I got to interview David and Jillian at the Paley Center in New York. The fact that they were still able to communicate most of the time this kind of passion, I think, is something that we should celebrate, but never lose sight of the fact that, you know, they were working hard to give that to us. But a lot of groundwork has been laid both in interest in X-Files because of that 20th anniversary and the response of the fandom and the wanting to see, like, maybe some kind of resolution to the mythology arc, more of what Mulder and Scully are up to, et cetera, but also the way television has changed. When that became commonplace, the idea of doing a limited run became very appealing. We wanted to do it again, and the question was, do we want to do it again? I got a call from uh, Dana Walden and Gary Newman telling me that they were thinking about bringing the uh, series back for a, a, a short run. I think ultimately, though, the person that was promoting this idea was David Duchovny. That's always a good thing. When he's behind it, Jillian got behind it, too. So I think it came from a creative place rather than a business place. 
at the point when Chris came to me and said that it was actually a, a real idea, something that Fox was open to, and the idea was that some of the old writers were gonna come back. That actually could be fun for a short period of time. Nobody but the FBI is most unwanted. I've been waiting 23 years to say that. Come in, it's open. As far as the writer-producers, the people you're going to see doing these episodes are the people who actually helped to create the X-Files series that you're familiar with. Me and Glenn were having dinner with Chris, and he says, you guys want to write and direct? And we both said, sure, if you'll buy dinner. About a year ago, which would have been June 2014, Chris gave me a call and said, you interested in doing this? I was like, absolutely. I think it's important to Chris on this go-round to get as many people that were around for the original first couple years or so, but they're all very talented people, and a lot of them are busy. Vince is busy, and Howard and Frank Spotnitz and Scheiben, they were all on shows, and Darren and I were the only losers that had nothing else to do. I immediately said yes, because even though I'm working on American Horror Story, X-Files is probably the one show that I remember the most fondly. You know, it actually gave me the career that I have now, it allowed me to make my movies and all that. Try again, please. And for me, this is all about sort of repaying a debt in a way. I'm scared. We met before we knew that we were certain to go forward. We needed that time to work out stories and to actually just sit and kind of get a feel for one another again. First, it was Chris and I met at this place, Bordner's, just off uh, Hollywood Boulevard. He told me what he was thinking. I'm like, oh, wow, OK. And then I told him what I was thinking. And I already knew what Darren was thinking. We didn't know what Jim had. I want to do this thing where there's a reality show and there's a monster in the mountains, you know? And then talk to Glenn, and he was doing the monster show. So I said, oh, I can't do that. That's very too many monster shows. Uh, let's go through the script. It wasn't a writer's room, per se. We didn't really work on each other's stories, except to tell them and make sure we didn't overlap. But I knew I wanted to do something with Mulder and Scully's child. We had a chance to board our stories, which means plot our stories, then come back and ask the group to critique our stories. We did that in Glenn Morgan's backyard. Uh, his wife put out this amazing spread of food. He brought the board with index cards, and he pitched his, and then I brought mine out. I think that was one of my favorite parts, you know, sitting in the backyard with those three guys. There's no pressure, you know, it's just like, we were trying to make each other, like, oh, that's a great idea, you know. It was very loose and informal. Here's this kind of story I want to do. And oftentimes, people that were working on the mythology, which were basically Chris and Frank, everybody else was doing their own separate standalone episodes. That's kind of similar here. And I'm sure that's weird for fans nowadays, because TV has changed so much. Every show is kind of one continuous story. But that was one of the things that made the X-Files kind of different. It was a natural to go back to Vancouver. It was our first place shooting the show. We had been up there for five years. There were fantastic crews. There were financial considerations, certainly. But uh, the reason for me to be up there was because Vancouver doubles for so many places that we like to tell X-Files stories. I just want to make sure it seems like a long stretch in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot of locations in every episode, very location heavy. We don't spend a lot of days in the studio. So when we get a script, we break it down with the art department, and we kind of go over what we think is the best ideas to take out on the road, which is most, <laughs> most options. You never go too far in X-Files where there isn't a hospital or a mental institute. And Riverview's a decommissioned mental hospital that offers an awful lot. So we ended up being there quite a lot, quite a lot more than I thought we would. It's a sort of vast, sprawling complex of buildings in various times of decay left fallow and taken over by the rats of us who are in the film industry because it's just a perfect playground for all the kind of stories. And in fact, early in the days of the X-Files, this building and its hallways and rooms were often used. You can make offices, we can make a forensic lab. You have here the trash man studio, you have nooks and crannies, you got tunnels. So it's like its own studio here. I, I don't know what you'd do without it. With good intentions, I think people might have been treated differently here with certain kind of mental illnesses. There's really an energy flowing around here. 
which contributes to the tone of a horror movie for the actors and crew. When we were scouting, we were in a facility around here and walked into this room that was being built. It was just four plywood walls at the time, but I could tell from the way the light was in set. I was like, this is Smaller's office. No, you, my phone. You, your phone, you call him. Of course, on social media, you hear rumblings and the stuff going on, and then you see articles about David and Jillian talking about it, and I was like going, well, I, we'll see. In this business, I don't count on anything until you're standing in front of the camera and it's rolling. And then one day my agent called and said, they're doing it and you're in it. I was very happy to hear that it was coming back. And for it to be able to have endured this period of time, of course, the fact that the show is what it is. And Netflix has been huge in keeping it out there. And we have new generations of fans as a result of it, you know? There's a particular kind of enthusiasm that people have right now for this coming back that feels like it's different than it would be even if they found out that there was another film. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of that is that people like things to be the same. You know, that if we are melancholic about something or if we are reminiscing about something from the past, that we would probably choose that if we were going to have it again, the popsicle or the, in this case, the TV show, that it is pretty identical to what it is that we've seen before. So there's a lot of nostalgia attached to it. And I, for the first time, I think, ridiculously, can imagine what that must be like as a fan. Walter, back in the day, I used to do stairs and in three-inch heels. Back in the day, Scully. You wanted Mulder and Scully to break out the flashlights, you know, you wanted to give that stuff. And when we're shooting it, it was like, you know, David and Julie and I were there, and he's like, we got the flashlights. I, something as stupid as the flashlight. Everybody's all excited. You know, but now when I watch it, I'm like, oh, brother, I feel a little whorish. I think we would have been kind of lame to just do that. You know, I like seeing the Rolling Stones, but I don't want to sit that close. And yeah, it would be like that. You know, and that was always important to me. If we're going to keep going, to not try to play the same exact characters doing the same things, because 22 years have passed. You saw Mulder and Scully at the end of the second movie rowing to a distant island somewhere in the tropics. I think it was Mulder and Scully row off into the sunset. I don't think anybody saw it. I remember shooting it. It was in a tank here in uh, Vancouver, and it was cold. And we were, you know, we were supposed to be rowing out in the middle of the Pacific, pretending to be rowing to Fiji, or wherever we were going to go. We were that thing on television where you have two people who love one another who don't get together. You know, that's television. And we had to keep not getting together. Uh, but then we got together towards the end. And where do you go from there? We split them up. We did that because it made sense to the characters based on Mulder's hopes and Mulder's dashed hopes that it might be difficult for Scully to remain in that relationship in any kind of healthy emotional way. So we played with that. <laughs> oh, poor Scully. I imagined a very brief scenario of increasing obsession ultimately oh, yeah. depression in Mulder and the strain that that potentially then had. You don't like coming back to this place, Jillian. It's the last place you want to come back, so this is But a, it didn't really story. feel important or necessary to map out what each year entailed. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, did we go through marriage counseling and then we took that surf vacation in Fiji together and that was really great. You know, it's nothing like that. That's why I'm here, Mulder. I'm here as someone who cares about you, as somebody who is worried about you. All right, well, just listen to me, OK? No, you when you put David and Jillian together, particularly in the scenes where they're not just arguing about a case or about the science or about the supernatural, but you actually put them in a situation where they're dealing with feelings and they're dealing with their relationship, they're always interesting scenes to me because you never quite know what's gonna happen. And that's really one of the things that makes the show special, is the chemistry that was there from the beginning with these two characters and what comes out of it. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure of exactly the way Jillian works. We just work together when we're on set. We don't really talk about whatever processes we do. We just kind of respect that the other's gonna show up and do what they do. And at this point, that's what it is. You know, when you have that much working history with somebody, the actual history is never something I think about. 
We don't have to. It's kind of an intuitive thing at this point. That scene on Mulder's porch, things came out of it that were beautiful that I actually hadn't anticipated. Give her the L. Uh, what did I do wrong? Something like this? Yes. Mulder and Scully, you know, they love each other. They've always loved each other, but they can't be together right now. Right. Take your line. Is this received wisdom from your magical mystery I have tour? a feeling there's a lot between the two of them that goes on in the way they communicate. That's not necessarily overtly romance-oriented, but that exemplifies their feelings for each other. Well, it's like any friendship. It's kind of ups and downs. You know, you have a lot of people that think that they're in love, and then there's other people that don't care about that. And then that's, I think, how it is in life. Some days you're speaking to each other, and other days you're not, and then you get over that. Yeah, very nice. You know, that's what life is. I'm a special agent, Dana Scully, and this is Agent Fox Mulder. You weren't sure, were you? I wasn't. <laughs> After the first one, which was all mythology-based and a lot of the past brought up and Mulder and Scully bickering, the second one was really just procedural and a monster of the week. I hadn't really read one of those for the longest time, because even when I came back to finish the show in the ninth year, it was all mythology stuff. And I was happy to read it. Glenn has almost a childish ability to find things that are uncannily gross and scary. You know, just these kind of weird little ideas that are kind of nightmarish. Uh, John, just go to your this is 2002. I was working on a movie here, Willard, and my wife Krista and I were going to see the Canucks and the Red Wings. The arenas downtown were walking down the street. Maybe thousands of people go in this direction. And standing in the street, tall man, just looking the other way. You know, we all talk about a thousand yard stare. This was just something different. It was in a long trench coat. And he had a Band-Aid attached here and attached there. Get terrified the two of us. Kristen and I still debate what was coming out of his nose. And she's like adamant it was his brains. But that really stuck with me. And I always thought, man, if we're still in X-Files, that's what I would do. Cut. That was Glenn. <laughs> Sorry. This book I really like, it's called The Philosophy of Horror, and they broke down, you know, monsters. Bram Stoker wrote in Dracula that the sight of him made people sick, that there were always like flies. And Todd Browning had armadillos or something in Dracula's lair. There was always like weird monsters and creatures following around and you had a big guy like that. And instead of just like following him on a dolly, why not attach the camera and you get a whole different sickening feeling. It's just to have the over the shoulder shot. I myself am six foot 11. So part of it would be for perspective. You don't get the smell of the monster that we're trying to convey. So what other kind of things can make you queasy? This body cam sort of makes the room go around. I don't know, I think I saw it originally on a Frankenheimer movie, Seconds. I don't know how they did that in those days, but it just gives a feeling of being disoriented and nausea creating. This is our black magic camera. Originally, Joel wanted to use the red camera, but considering the weight and it going on to Jillian, it seemed like a more logical idea to use what I call the mini Alexa. Do you want to see what weight's like? And then we can... Oh! <laughs> oh, gotcha. oh, it's fine, it's fine. The body cam was very light. As soon as I put it on, in order to adjust my physicality to incorporate it, I ended up standing in a position that reminded me of being heavily pregnant. You know, in order not to bump into things, you walk in a different way. And I felt like it was the same thing I was leading from my back. Oh, look at that. I love that shot. Drunk Scully. <laughs> I mean, I enjoy experimenting with those things, and I know it's fun for the camera guys. We used a Koa 8-millimeter lens, which had a little bit more wraparound to see the background more. Because I'm sure you're going to cut now to that shot of Jillian walking down the stairs. Cabby! That's good. That's, that's, that's I like good. that. Yeah. A graphic designer came up with this character <laughs> in stencil form, which, you know, is a contemporary expression today in street art, so it's very current in theme, I think. He had very distinctive head and very distinctive arms, 
And these were things that I wanted to make sure read clearly. The notes that were given to me sort of Frankenstein-esque, but there's a vulnerability with that as well, so I wanted that to come through. I feel sorry for him, he looks sad. We should go to Sotheby's on this. I guess Banksy ultimately was an influence on some of the stuff we did, not so much in style, but more in character. He's a ghost. He is one of the best political satirists that I've seen in a long time, and he's of the people. So we had a strong direction for our onset art. Most graffiti artists have a tag. Just like the rat is for Banksy, I decided for Trash Man it should be a banana peel because that's fairly a universal image for trash. But also, if you look closely, or maybe I'm the only one who sees it, it's also a man kneeling with his arms splayed, and it's him being overpowered by the man or some sort of symbolism like that as well. So it's very deep, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Camera. Really great production designers really come from a place of character too, that you can look around this room and know so much about the Trash Man character. Our Tortuga. It's my homage to Vince. The challenge was to create a strong visual voice for Trash Man and his world. But when Tim Armstrong was cast, it turns out he's as well an accomplished artist and his artwork sort of brought a kind of further energy, a texture to the ghoulishness that comprised his creations in the story. Tim came first, like you just go, man, that guy is so interesting. My two oldest kids and I are just hardcore rancid fans. Things he was talking about in some of his songs, sidekick and things like that, that I'm like, oh, this is kind of what this character would be like. Okay. And really wrote it with his voice in my head toward doing it. Action. People on the streets, the homeless, street people, they ain't got no voice, right? They get treated like trash. I mean, actual trash. Sometimes you want to work with someone you respect, and it's just like, oh, uh, yeah, you got to run around, or it doesn't go well, or as a manager, they're going to charge you more money, or they're just creeps, or whatever. And I was like, I don't want this thing ruined uh, for my kids and I. You know, we really share this thing. I figured out who Rance's manager was likely to be. There was a very professional email. And boom, I hit send. He asked a simple question. Would I be interested in acting in the X-Files? And I was like, I never done any like acting professionally, but I couldn't say no because X-Files is one of my favorite shows of all time. I didn't bring him here. He came to me. Rancid used to watch X-Files religiously on our tour bus. In the late 90s, we were on tour all the time, and X-Files was like one show that we could all agree on, you know what I mean? Like, everybody in the band kind of met at that show. So I went down to Tim's studio with my wife Kristen and my daughter Chelsea, and we put them on tape. Since I looked over the bad suit building, man, mm -hmm. yeah. looked down on the lawn, no, I'm suburban lady. It's like got some vitriol in it. Yeah. And that's how he qualifies people. Like the Band-Aid nose man, for me, that's how I do it. <laughs> well, I always yeah, yeah. qualify people by their adjective. Right. Kristen, she's a very talented actress, and she kind of walked me through the script, you know, because I had never been on an audition before. The people out on those streets, the homeless, the street people, man, they ain't got no voice, right? We roused in for two hours, and then we cut it together and put it into Fox, and it went great. So that fear of sending the email is unwarranted because it's only become, I was just like so proud of, you know, what he did. It's fun. I appreciated talking to Glenn, finally, you know, getting a sense about his motivation for writing this particular episode and how meaningful it was for him. I don't want it to conflict with the cross, because the cross has been there from the Yeah. But it's so just it's okay like that... God and money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's about money. My mom's a lover of <laughs> shopping channel jewelry, and when she passed away, um, there was the box of the stuff, and, uh, and it was a quarter in a frame on a cheap necklace. Yes. No one had ever seen it on my mom before. And we looked at the date. It was none of our birthdays. It wasn't the death of her father. I had no idea what this quarter was, if somebody gave it to her or what. And I'm like, that's mine because it just shows that, you know, you can actually come from somebody. You spend all this time in your life 
with them and still not have all the answers. And, uh, you know, whenever I go somewhere that my mom would like to have gone to or whatever, I'll put that on. But it's just another little mystery in life that you're never going to have an answer to. Honoring that as much as it is counterintuitive in a television show to let that just be would be one thing but is also potentially an opportunity in the future to become something else that has a different meaning. And I don't know which direction they're gonna go with it. And let's cut. All right, let's play some ball. Home is home. Then Never Again was the last show that Jim and I did. And I look at home, this one, and Never Again as sort of the Scully trilogy. I can tell. You don't have no children. A home she had brought up. What would it be like to be a mother? And kind of a weird empathy with Ma Peacock. And this was now dealing with her mother and trying to deal with herself as a mother. So it just seemed like a natural to be home again. Is there a history of genetic abnormalities in your family? No. Well, just find yourself a man with a spotless genetic makeup and a really high tolerance for being second guessed and start pumping out the little Uber scullies. Knowing that we were in part mirroring a scene on a bench that we'd had many, many years before with a similar subject matter, it was fun to play with the historical reverberations. I looked at last night and it's like, the baby just out treated like trash. trash. Oh, yeah. You didn't even know you were plagiarizing yourself. As a director, you're just looking for someplace interesting to put it. Then they're in a hallway and you go, what do you got to go bench? I go, I go, oh, the bench. So for fans of the show, I went back and I looked at home. I belong with you. Now you can see 20 years later the type of things they were talking about Scully. compared to what they were talking about 20 years ago as much younger people. I never saw you as a mother before. Yeah. Okay, here we go again. 27, take one. Mark Cameron. Very much. My son is named William, too. Mom, 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 mom. I stay now. Ironically, one of my kids back in London was sick at the same time as I was being asked within the body of the text you to emote about being a parent and abandoning one's child. <laughs> here I am in Vancouver, abandoning my child for the sake of this scene. And so that was the point that my emotions just wouldn't let me tap in anymore. Slightly strongly, the fact that I called her meat. I didn't mean to call her meat. Called her meat? I called her meat. I called my mom meat. Not trash? You Not called her trash. Meat? Well, she's being recycled. Yeah. She's an organ donor. Yeah, it's nice. Oh, okay. It's a good happy ending. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought something was going to happen out of that. <laughs> I thought some magic was going to happen. Oh, hey. you know, it was a rough day. One of her sons had become ill over in England, and so she was far away. And so when we got to that part where it's time to lose it, you know, she's a friend of mine. I don't want to go use it. You know, I, I don't want to do that. I could cry about my mom dying. I could cry about this. But to talk about something so immediately close to home. Her last words were about our child. just was not going to happen. And that's frustrating. I'm so far away from being emotional for this scene. I just can't seem to call, get there. Call. Okay, okay, cut, cut. I'm sorry. She's a better actor than I am director, so it's not like I'm trying to direct her to this. If she had okay, said to me, scream at me right now and call me names, I'd have done it. But I didn't approach her knowing what to do. I was like, what do you want me to do for you? She just said, go get Sheila, who plays the mother, and then we brought Sheila up, and. Jillian just looked at her eyes, and um, she goes, I'm ready. Here we go, guys. The last words were about her grandchild that we gave away. I don't think I've ever quite had that kind of a challenge before, where the material that I'm working with is mirroring real life so profoundly. That was better. Yeah. yeah. That was Sheila's last shot, you guys. Oh. <laughs> Her mother-in-law. She's my former mother-in-law. <laughs> I know you're disappointed at this. <laughs> I've always felt the Bible approach for a show is limiting 
because it doesn't take into consideration the people that come to work on it. You hire people like Glenn Morgan and James Wong, Darren Morgan, uh, Howard Gordon and Alex Gonza. If it's too laid out, I think it hems those people in. Okay, you're in the farmhouse and you deliver the baby, a push. I just asked Chris, are you doing William here or there? And you know, then it wouldn't be bad to kind of, where are they now, you know? I mean, 15 years had passed and did she think of him? Did William think of her? I went back and did my homework and looked at those mythology episodes to find out where things stood with William, where it was Mulder, and all the things that had happened in the time that Jim and I left. I gave him up. Early on in the series, Jillian Anderson got pregnant. It all of a sudden gave us a problem to solve, how to deal with her pregnancy and how to hide it. We actually had Scully abducted, and it made for an interesting thread to follow through the course of the series. We're following it now, even into the 10th season. And it's a very sweet thing to me that Piper came to work on the show after having her birth a big part of the show, of Jillian's life, that she would come to work in the art department and actually be so appreciated there. Her dad's a production designer and we met on the show. She grew up in Vancouver in my trailer on the show. so a kind of remarkable circle there. And they gave her real stuff to do. It wasn't getting coffee, it wasn't running errands. You know, it was putting together file stuff and she got to work in the special effects makeup department and proper drawing and design and monsters. What we needed was somebody to draw police sketches. The entire art department was buried. Normally we bring in an illustrator if we can't do it in house. And I just decided, well, maybe we should give Piper a shot at this. So she burned about six versions of this thing out. We showed them to Darren, and he loved them. So her hand is in pretty much every episode we did. They gave her responsibility and trusted her to follow through, and she follows through. And I'm really proud of her. Manager's POV looking through the eye hole you see the monster staring up at him and coming towards him. Okay. The monster looking at him. And the basic idea for the episode I had a long time ago that I didn't get a chance to do, the monster transforming into a man rather than vice versa, just playing around with those things that, you know, amuse me, so. That little flip to me is very Darren-like. Just the bare twist on, you know, man bites lizard, which seems so obvious when you think about it. Although, not many people would think about a man biting a lizard. You have to go there first. But just to turn the werewolf myth on its head like that is kind of brilliant. To think about it the other way, it gives you more empathy for the creature that turns. And I think if we had that empathy for werewolves, we wouldn't be hunting them so often. It's not their fault that they change, you know? What we should be doing is doing something with the moon, stopping that from going full. I always wanted a more classic universal horror, Frankenstein, Creature of the Black Lagoon type of thing. Screaming. It's supposed to be a horror monster, but I also need to kind of do some funny stuff with the monster. So he's got to be more mobile and just practical things like that. But the special effects makeup guy, when you go monster, they just get all excited. So that kind of takes care of itself. Pretty much how I started the whole concept is first I found the right pair of underwear to work with and then I built the scales out from the underwear. It's based off a Texas horn lizard, which is a creature that spits blood from its eye as a defense mechanism. Darren didn't want to physically see the character spit blood out of its eyes, so I thought, okay, well, the next best thing would be why not make the eyes of the character red so the blood is always present. You know, the fluke man was like really thick and heavy and I wanted to make sure that this monster had facial expression and stuff like that. And I was talking to Bill about it and we're going back and forth and I go, you know, I don't know if you know, but like I was the guy in the fluke man. And he goes, yeah, I know, I was the assistant makeup guy. Like I didn't recognize him. So it was kind of nice all these years. Now he's doing the design to be able to talk about that. We covered him from head to toe in a full rubber suit that weighed maybe 120 pounds. I assured Darren that it would be a much less cumbersome experience than what we had done prior, and I decided to take a different approach to treat all the pieces as separate individual appliances, pre-painting everything in my shop, and then when we went to set, it was just a matter of assembling the puzzle. There is the reptilian side of the character, his true self. Ryan plays that role. That's my double. 
so he dresses in the entire Thank outfit so that when I transform, he can do the movements and be the lizard, and I'd be sitting back in my chair having another coffee. Good work, Ryan. I wouldn't have run like that. Although I had to do the mid-transformation, so I have to have, I think, 40% of the makeup on. It felt good, actually, because I felt like it was more relaxing being the creature I was supposed to be rather than the human that I had become. So my awkward human behavior, which when you see it, you may think, oh, why is he acting like that? Is he just a bad actor? No, it's me acting as a human for the first time. Sorry, I saw a fly. Should have. Well, I tried. Haven't got my old tongue. The lizard isn't innocent. I want to help you. And Reese plays an innocent well. Not like a wide-eyed, doe-eyed innocent, but there's a certain kind of innocence to him, just having been working with him. Strangle me. OK, ready? I know what you're trying to do. The green glass, the appendix. <laughs> but that's good. Oh, let's go from the top then. I have always, even back in the old scripts, felt that David kind of got my sense of humor. I think that's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Let's do that again. And not everybody does. Or he may have a different variation on the joke, and we'll have a little discussion about what is the best way to do it. But those are just tweaks. And just as I gave up the search, I saw him. Dagu, keep getting bigger there. All right. You know, we kind of tried to flex in different ways when we do scenes, you know, bigger, smaller, that would be our vocabulary. Dagu! You know, and there's this gradation of reality and funny, and it's sliding around. That wasn't huge? <laughs> OK, all right. Dagu! No, the man who had bit me and turned me into a human. <laughs> really? I was... <laughs> yeah, Tegu. OK, OK. But just as I had given up, I saw him. Dagu? No, the man who had bit me and took. <laughs> <laughs> Dagu! The idea that being a person would be so painful, that's often what Darren's writing is about. And he found a vehicle in this case to say it through a lizard who has the misfortune of having to be a little bit human for a while. And he's like, what the f is this? This is awful. I just want to be a lizard. I don't want to get a job. I mean, that's Darren. Darren is that lizard. Oh, that's it. I quit. Darren's hilarious because he's so quiet and self-depreciating and outwardly depressed. Yeah, thank you. You know, he'll come into set with his head bowed, and he gestures. He's like, and then say, like, you know, and then go like this, and then, and then go, <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> I don't think you really want me to do that. <laughs> um, but anyways, we make fun of him. The fact that he's even here is a feat in and of itself, so I'm hugely grateful for him showing up and doing this with us. Yeah, OK, what, is that the Amarillo? Yes, it is. Have you been taking your meds? Scully. What Mulder's going through and coming back to the X-Files is kind of similar, I guess, to what I felt coming back to the show, which is, whoa, this sounds great. But then there's a moment where you go, hmm, is it? Because you go, I've already done this. Is this what I should be doing with my life? Should I have not have done something further with my life? All that kind of midlife crisis nonsense. Spend what's left. So I managed to use my mixed feelings and try to give some of that to mold it. Oh, so close. I was unhappy with my pencil throwing in the beginning. I got better at it. I wish that I could have been better earlier. <laughs> that was good. All of it from top to toe, yeah. that was good. Good. Jillian likes let's move on. I like that one. We had some problems at the beginning. God damn it, no. It's all in the, it's all in the wrist. We did have a special effects thing set up to make sure we at least got one. Take your time. So speak. Take your time. But then Duchovny came through at the end. Thank God, there you go. Oh. So hot. <laughs>